This is California, the golden state and one of the largest economies in the world in its own right. If California was counted as a sovereign nation, it would be the fifth largest by GDP, with a $3.2 trillion gross state product, putting it just behind Germany and just ahead of India. Of course, the state has a lot going for it, from the largest movie and technology centres in the world all the way to a surprisingly strong agricultural sector. All of this has meant that the residents of California are on average doing very well for themselves. And one look around the wealthy enclaves of Los Angeles and San Francisco would back this assumption up. Despite all of this, however, the state is going through a period of economic turbulence. The fallout of the coronavirus has hit the state's economy particularly hard. Major industries like tourism and media creation have ground to a complete halt, having widespread knock-on implications and hitting a lot of smaller vendors who were once reliant on these industries. This bump in the road, however, was by no means the total undoing of the state. California's metrics before 2020 looked very strong, with low unemployment, solid growth and booming industries. But there were still cracks forming. The state is home to the largest population in the US, but the industries that were truly driving wealth creation are famously bad at actually employing people. This had led to a sharp increase in social issues like homelessness and crime. All of these problems that were once bubbling away under the surface have now been massively accelerated. So much so that many economists have predicted that the sun might be setting on the Sunshine State. Now that may sound like absurdist alarmism, but it's a reality that shouldn't be totally dismissed. Remember in previous decades, there was another economic region in the US riding the high of a new growth industry, but these days, Detroit is not exactly seen as the bastion of prosperity it once was. So, could the same grim reality be in store for California? Well, to answer this, we need to look at a few key areas. What made the state so prosperous before the 2020 downturn? What were the underlying issues impacting the economy? How will these issues be impacted by the wider economic decline? And finally, while we are at it, we may as well give it an EE national economy score and put it on the leaderboard. I know, I know, it's a state, but with a GDP in the trillions of dollars, it certainly deserves an entry. This video was brought to you by Trends. What's Trends? Ha, huh, I'm glad you asked. Trends is the internet's ultimate knowledge hub for entrepreneurs, investors, and startup CEOs. It's the brainchild of The Hustle the free-to-read email newsletter read by over a million people every morning. Stay tuned until the end to learn more, or pause the video and go to trends.co slash ee, where you can try Trends for two weeks, all for just one dollar. Now that's a deal. Trends.co slash ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Now this year has certainly been one for doom and gloom, but it is still important to address what is working well. Any economy that can grow to the level that California has and provide so much wealth and prosperity to its citizens is probably doing something right. So what was the driver of the Californian dream? California is both really lucky and really unlucky in terms of its geography. The state had a big head start over other states in the Union when it was getting started because it had access to decent farmland, a good year-round climate, oh, and an ocean for fishing and trade. On the flip side of that coin, it was literally about as far away from the economic centres in the US as one could reasonably get while still within the US. Nonetheless, the state grew well as a distant outpost that attracted farmers, gold diggers, and or people that would rather be a little bit removed from all of that pesky law and order in the East. The first big win for the state in the modern era was its film industry, which was curiously also at least partially thanks to its geography and position in the world. You see, early film technology relied heavily on lots of light and good weather. That's one thing that California has in abundance. I mean, it's right there in the name. What's more is that a lot of this new cinema was filmed using technologies that had patents on them. Primarily patents owned by Thomas Edison and his businesses that were headquartered in New York. By conducting business in Los Angeles, up and coming film companies felt more comfortable not being found out for using much cheaper film equipment that was not paying royalties back to Edison for his patents. Now this all meant two things. 
For starters, it hopefully makes you feel a little bit less guilty about watching a cheeky movie for free online, but more importantly, it established LA as the centre of the movie business. We actually plan to do an entire video on the economics of Hollywood, but for now, just know that eventually of course, camera technology got to a point where film locations were not as important and modern studios do pay what they owe to their suppliers, but once these studios were established, they got comfortable. Support industries sprung up, film related unions were founded, and it almost got to a point where it was really hard to film anywhere but LA. So, through nothing but being in the right place at the right time and turning a blind eye some 100 years ago, California is now the epicenter of one of the largest industries in the world. This would go on to become a common theme. The tech revolution that has started Silicon Valley was mostly formed around Stanford University, which was one of the first universities in the nation to offer computer science as a course. Once a few companies got going, other tech companies were attracted to the same area, and along with them came people with expertise to create new technology. Once this modern gold rush hit a critical mass, Silicon Valley just became the logical place to conduct tech business because it naturally ticked all the boxes. Access to suppliers, access to investors, and access to skilled workers. Given that technical development by its very nature can be virtually rolled out anywhere, being in and amongst a huge pool of competitors is not as much of an issue as it would be for customer facing industries like retail, hospitality, or even manufacturing. In fact, having this ecosystem actually makes everything much easier. You need a part that only a niche tech manufacturer in the world makes, good chance it will be in Silicon Valley. You need to consult with the world leader in some type of technical infrastructure, chances are Silicon Valley is the place to find them. This whole process is called agglomeration, which is a fancy word for the benefits an industry receives by being geographically close to its industry partners and peers. Being lucky enough to just happen to have the nuclei around which the largest industry in the world formed became par for the course for California. Now a lot of this was good planning, and the state did a lot of things right to nurture the growth of these industries, but luck did play an undoubtedly huge part. All the same, even if North Dakota happened to be the early center for technical innovation, it's hard to see it having the same appeal to tech companies and their staff as the blue skies and sandy beaches of California. Now so far, this all sounds great. California has a diverse portfolio of wealth creating industries that are not dependent on limited resources to sustain. But suffering from success does start to become an issue in its own right, especially when California is home to a lot of people that don't call it home. For a lack of better way of putting it, welcome to the Hotel California. Gold rushes throughout history were not good for local economies long term. They see a massive spike in new workers, all desperately seeking their riches, and this does create some short term wins. Businesses catering to this foot traffic can be built and maybe even some taxes can be levied. But once the gold is dug, everything goes right back to where it was. Now the California gold rush is a distant memory these days. However, state is not immune to the same effects on a larger scale. Moving to LA to try and make it in the film industry or San Francisco to earn fat stacks as a developer are pretty common endeavors. The issue is that these types of employment don't actually give too much back to the economy. An influx of computer programmers getting paid six figures for graduate positions means that things like real estate become unaffordable to long term residents that moved into other industries. Real estate also drives up rents for commercial buildings, which get passed along to consumers as higher costs of living. It would be next to impossible for a worker earning the national average wage to move to the Bay Area and expect to live a comfortable lifestyle, even as a single adult, not to mention with a family. So people either make sacrifices like living with roommates or parents, or they move away. Now particularly cold hearted viewers might say that trading in some average income earning local residents for some exceptionally skilled and well compensated computer nerds is probably a good trade to make, but it isn't. For starters, you can't run a city on computer code, yet. Someone needs to be there to stock the whole foods for all of these guys, and unless produce packer is a job role that starts to attract a six figure salary, these people need to be accommodated in some way, or else demand pull inflation 
can get dangerous very fast. But the real issue is that these people don't stay for long. San Francisco has the highest level of internal migration within the USA. That means lots of people are moving in and lots of people are moving out. That's because people working in Silicon Valley don't tend to do it for very long. A few years in the industry gets people great experience and a nice big pile of cash to take back to their hometowns. During this time, most of these workers will live below their means and focus pretty heavily on work. They won't be living family lives that give back to local industries because, well, it's too expensive. Even these well compensated tech employees would struggle to raise a family in Southern California given the cost of living. It's a pretty common industry game plan. Graduate university, get a job in a fang company, stick it out for 5 years, save up some cash, live in a tiny apartment, and then move back to your home city and live like a king doing consultation work. So people paying a lot of money for a short term stay in modest comfort, I guess the Hotel California is open for business, but you can actually leave. To try and make the best of this bad situation, the California government levies the highest state income taxes in the nation. The general idea is that sure, these outside workers can come and make their millions but at least it will generate lots of revenue for the government that they can then use to address some of the issues caused by said workers. Now in theory, this is fine and it actually worked well for some time, but it was a precarious balancing act. The slightest breeze could throw it off course, which is exactly where the hurricane that is 2020 came in. The Hotel California for the first time ever was starting to see mass vacancies. The economic fallout of the coronavirus has been a major hit to everybody, but the consequences have been especially severe in the United States and especially severe in California. For starters, nobody is making a movie or going on a beach holiday or attending Disneyland at the moment, so that has been a major direct blow. But what might end up being more severe is the consequences that are a little bit harder to notice. People are starting to leave. The push to work from home means that the aforementioned tech workers no longer need to live in a cramped one bedroom apartment in the Bay Area. They can instead just do exactly the same thing in a nice family home anywhere in the nation while enjoying a much better quality of life and paying much less in tax. That same income tax designed to make the most of those high income earners while they were there is now pushing more and more people away. The issue of capital flight is an argument that is often brought up to dissuade governments from passing laws on high income earners. To speak candidly, most of the time these arguments are weak at best. Most people will not move their families to a new nation to save a few thousand dollars on taxes, but a single worker moving to a new city in the same country, well, that's a far more compelling prospect. In fact, while I was in the process of writing this script, Graham Stephan, a personal finance YouTuber, posted a breakdown of exactly why he is leaving California and moving to Las Vegas to live. Now, Graham does not work in the tech industry, but he is still indicative of those types of workers. Young, well off, with a business that he can do from anywhere, without a family. Of course, one man's experience does not a trend make, but this reason for leaving was very in line with the research that we conducted. So anyway, go and check out that video. He's a good egg, that Graham. Okay, I know California is not a country and this says national leaderboard, but it's still interesting nonetheless. And I mean, Hong Kong gets a spot, so why not, right? Size is simply phenomenal. California would make for a huge national economy in its own right, but the fact that it's just one part of the US gives you an idea of just how influential economies like the world's superpowers really are. It gets a 9 out of 10, of course falling short of the 14 figure GDP club, but still one of the largest most influential economies in the world. GDP per capita is also very high. As temperamental as they may be, the state is still home to a lot of very skilled, very industrious workers, and with that a GSP per capita of $72,000 in 2019 gets it a 9 out of 10. Curiously enough, the state or territory within the US with the highest GDP per capita is the District of Columbia, with a whopping $162,000 as of 2008, which actually puts it in line with places like Monaco. Stability and confidence. 
This is really subjective, and had it been asked 12 months ago, it would have been a clear 10 out of 10. But flying so high means that it has a long way to fall, and it has historically felt the impacts of downturns more heavily than the national average, which is of course still very well deserved for a state with such a diverse portfolio of world leading industries. Growth is pretty stable, the economy is large and reflects a developed nation in its own right, and the growth figures reflect this as well. Outside of 2020, it has averaged a 2-3% growth rate over the past few decades, so it gets a 6 out of 10. Finally, industry. Well, come on, what else could it be? If anything could get an 11 out of 10, it would be California for its industry. But in the meantime, it will need to make do with a nice round 10 out of 10. Altogether, this gives the Sunshine State an average score of 8.4 out of 10, just falling short of the top spot. Of course, with the same big asterisk as Hong Kong, that this is not actually a nation. California would be a remarkable economy if it was its own nation, but in a way, it's even more so as just a very productive piece of a grander American puzzle. But that does not mean it's not without concern. Yes, it has been fortunate enough to attract a lot of very profitable businesses and very skilled people that come with them. Yes, its lovely beaches and attractions will continue to bring in tourists and businesses alike, but it can't rest on its laurels. Many economies throughout history have thought they were the epicentre of industries that would last forever, became overly reliant on them, and then suffered as those same industries faded into obscurity. There is no such thing as an unsinkable ship, and when all of the smart people start heading for the life rafts, it might be time to look out for icebergs ahead. Who would have thought that the golden child of American industry would have been hit so hard, in so many unusual ways, in such a short amount of time? It's one of those events that you don't see happening until it's too late. Unless you have some fantastic insights. Like the ones provided by Trends. The internet's definitive knowledge hub for entrepreneurs and aspiring ones alike. Which reminds me, question for you. Have you ever wondered what internet millionaires and gazillionaires all have in common? Hint, they're smart. Like really smart. And with a subscription to Trends, you can be too. Trends gives you exclusive access to the same information that was previously only available to hedge fund managers and high achieving CEOs. We're not only talking about the internet's best and most exclusive content library, we're talking about access. Access to people you would otherwise never be able to get in front of. With a subscription to Trends, you can also attend the live Q&A sessions hosted by industry leading entrepreneurs as well as connect with other high achievers both in real life and digitally. As Warren Buffett once said, the best investment you can ever make is in yourself. Try it out for two weeks, all for just $1 at trends.co slash ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Thanks for watching guys. Bye.